So I want to thank um, Douglas and Joanna for joining us today. Um, they've been out of school for 15 plus years, right? <laughs> and uh, have done a lot of work um, with UN, UN agencies, UN missions. So they're going to share that with us today. And uh, if you have a question, please put it into the Q&A or you can throw it into the chat. Um, and what I'd like to ask you guys each to start with is to kind of just um, give us your bios. How did you get to where you are today? You know, so uh, Joanna, do you want to start? Sure, okay. Yeah, no, thank you so much for hosting this and hi to the students and it's, it's great to be in touch and sorry that some of your summer plans have been um, adapted or put on hold. It's, it's a tough summer, I think, for everyone. Um, so yes, yeah, so as Heather said, I uh, graduated from Tufts in 2004 and I was part of the EPIC class that year. Um, and following that, I, I knew that I wanted to go into international affairs, but I wasn't really sure sort of in which direction that would take, um, whether it would be towards the peace building side or humanitarian and development side. Um, and so I ended up going to Senegal um, for a year on a Fulbright research scholarship. And that helped me to sort of solidify that I wanted to work on uh, women in development and women in humanitarian affairs and sort of um, have that gender angle, but I still wasn't really sure what that looked like. Um, so I knew I needed to, to sort of get to work. Um, so after that, I, um, I went for um, a, a master's degree um, at Columbia in New York. And, and through that, I started doing some sort of more hands-on work. So I worked with UNDP in the Central African Republic. And then that led to um, uh, some other opportunities in Africa. And so um, basically I've been working um, in the sort of early recovery context or humanitarian context, mostly in Africa um, and the Caribbean as well. And then in the past um, few years or so, um, at a global level advising UN agencies that are working in humanitarian affairs on their programming specifically um, across basically all the regions that they work in. Um, so I came at it from sort of the development angle and now I'm really sort of squarely in the humanitarian affairs um, world. And so I've worked with UNICEF, uh, UNHCR, and now I'm working with UNFPA. Um, so, I mean, I started out, so, you know, in, in, as a Fulbrighter, it was mostly uh, research. And then, um, so I kind of came at it from, from that angle, from the research angle, but I also um, knew that I wanted to work with NGOs and really have that hands-on sort of programming approach. So that's why I started with NGOs and then um, moved to the UN a little bit later in my career. So that's, that's the summary. Great, great, thank you. And can you just explain, I don't know if everyone knows what um, early recovery. Sure, yeah, there, so there are different terms now. I think we call it more the humanitarian development nexus and even that is kind of a recycled term that's been around for a while. Um, but basically I would just, um, you know, to differentiate it from, from what Douglas will speak about, um, you know, we have peacekeeping in the UN, we have um, UN country programming that takes a more long-term development view and typically works with governments. And so some UN agencies um, have that development view and work with governments, and then they also do emergency response, which is the humanitarian side. And some UN agencies are really squarely in the humanitarian side of things, but they're being pushed to connect more with the more development oriented agencies. And basically the whole UN is being, um, you know, encouraged to sort of bring those sides together. And that's been happening for a long time, but there's been sort of substantial UN reform lately that has brought those things together. So that's a roundabout way of saying that early recovery was one of the terms maybe 10 years ago for um, you know, linking the immediate humanitarian response to thinking about long-term development, linking to government programs and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's continued to be, to be really important. And of course we see it today in terms of the COVID response that you have um, you know, crises in countries that not only have development issues, but also um, you know, emergencies at the same time. So. Great, thank you. Thank you, Douglas. All right, so uh, um, I graduated in 2002 and I did EPIC in 2000, 2001 and then I audited uh, in 01, 02. Um, uh, after I, I studied philosophy at Tufts and peace studies. Uh, so as every good philosophy major does, I moved back home with my mom uh, after graduation and uh, then worked as a mediator. So I mean, my, my background is a little bit, I guess, you know, rooted in, in political activism. And so I was, knew I was very much interested in um, 
sort of interpersonal conflict. Uh, and that sort of, in a way, has come around full circle now in the work that I do now. Uh, but initially, it was doing victim offender mediation, um, doing that in courts and in, in prisons, um, and then also just sort of general activism and, you know, getting arrested in 2003 at the start of the Iraq War and that kind of stuff, which is more of my uh, uh, satisfied that. Uh, part of the reason why I was interested in, in uh, mediation is that uh, violence has always been, I don't know if fascinate is not the right word, but it's always been a very important um, uh, thread, I guess, in everything. Uh, my mom is German and I grew up in Germany. So a lot of the, the way that I think about and approach the world is sort of in, in the lens of, of World War II and the Holocaust and trying to come to terms with what that means um, and trying to think about institutional ways in which we can respond to atrocities, uh, which is really very much a topic of this year's epic class. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked uh, for a couple of years as a victim offender mediator in uh, local courts in Hartford. My mom uh, taught at Trinity, so that was very easy to go to live there and still show up for, for some epic stuff then uh, the following year. Um, then I went to Nigeria and I realized at a certain point, and I was working there doing uh, local uh, work on a, on a inter uh, and on a communal basis in, in some communities in the so-called Middle Belt and in the Niger Delta. Um, and it occurred to me when I was looking for jobs and I was hardly getting paid anything, uh, that every, all the jobs that I was interested in that seemed really exciting to me all required a master's, where they would say master's required, PhD desirable or something like that. And so I thought, oh shit, well, I guess that means I'm gonna go back to graduate school, something that I thought that I wouldn't do because both my parents are academics. So it didn't really uh, make, you know, it wasn't something that, that seemed obvious. Uh, um, so I went, I did a, a JD and then an LLM. Um, and after that sort of, during that time the initial idea was to work in, in mediation and, and doing that. And so I thought that having a JD would at least make me sound credentialed uh, in the way that having a philosophy degree might not. Um, I still love having a philosophy degree, so I'm not trying to bad enough uh, for any philosophy majors out there. Um, and so then I, but while I was in law school, I sort of fell in love with, with international criminal law, and so-called humanitarian law, which is different, um, you know, for, I, I don't know if you've, how much reading you've done on humanitarian law, which is different from the humanitarian uh, work that, uh, um, it was just, you know, that Joanna was just talking about. So then I went off to Cambodia and I started working at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal in the prosecution. And that sort of precipitated, I don't know, five, six years of working at the Special Court for Sierra Leone in The Hague um, and working at the, uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in Arusha on two different stints, working in Bahrain on a truth commission or a sort of a human rights investigation, not a truth commission, uh, but, but a human rights investigation, uh, the so-called Bass Uni Commission, um, and then working in Sicily on, on the Libyan Civil War. Um, so then, at, you know, while I was in Rwanda, sort of the story of my, my life with the UN has been in some ways sort of short-term uh, consultancies and then getting jobs as a staff member, closing missions. So I worked at the Rwanda Tribunal and then got a job in 2014 to go to, uh, to Liberia to work with the peacekeeping mission there uh, and that's when my sort of career shifted a little bit from uh, doing international criminal law to doing uh, rule of law work, uh, which is different again, because that sort of talks about if, if international criminal law is looking uh, uh, retroactively or retrospectively at, at what has happened and trying to figure out what to do about it, um, rule of law work uh, and the type that I do is very much thinking about prospectively and the types of uh, work in this institutions that we create to to do uh, or to prevent atrocities or to rebuild states in a way after they've been uh, broken in, in some profound ways. And, and now the last few years I've been in Afghanistan um, and we'll be going to South Sudan as soon as things get uh, uh, better. So yeah, that's, that's the short part of it. And I just say is that, you know, in, in, in Afghanistan, we talk not just about the, the so-called double nexus, but the triple nexus. Uh, since everything always has to increase in number and, and seriousness, I guess. So we can talk about that too, if people are interested. Great, great, thank you. And so now I'd like to ask each of you to really kind of talk about your experiences working with the UN 
kind of, you know, whether it's been as a consultant, whether it's been hired as a staffer in missions in the home offices, you know, like what are all the, the different pieces of that to think about if people are considering kind of wanting to work with the UN or going in that direction? Joanne, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, sure. So, I mean, so I've been working with the UN, let's see, for about, um, about six years. Um, and I've worked um, mostly as a consultant, actually, but also as a staff member, temporary staff member, um, for various reasons. But yes, there are those different sort of contract types, which are important to think about. Um, there are opportunities like UNB and JPO, which is um, UN volunteer and junior professional officer, which I think can be very good opportunities um, if you can get in uh, young, because you do start kind of at the bottom of a very long ladder. And I'd say, I mean, from the humanitarian side, at least the biggest difference between um, NGOs and the UN and from someone who worked, you know, in the field with NGOs for a while before switching to, back to the UN, um, there's, a, there's a big hierarchy in the UN. And it, it's a little bit tough to... Um, to sort of jump around that or jump over that. So, um, so when you start sort of right out of grad school, it, it typically would be in a, like a UNB position or a junior professional officer position, again, at least on the humanitarian side and also from what I know of UNDP. Um, but, but those can be interesting entry points. So for example, you know, it's, it's, Tufts has a very international um, student body. So if, they're, if your countries are sponsoring JPOs, I would really encourage you to apply. Um, you know, that being said, um, the UN takes JPOs who are, you know, I think up to 34 and they take people who are, you know, 33 and eight months and you have people who've already worked as a lawyer somewhere or have done other things. So the competition is stiff, but I think if you can start that way, um, it, it's good. And otherwise, there's also the possibility of um, starting out with NGOs or with, um, with civil society organizations or, or basically just anything outside the UN and sort of coming in um, laterally when you develop a sort of technical expertise or perhaps a regional expertise um, that, would, that would make sense for certain agencies. Um, and so I, I guess in my experience, the thing that I, I liked about it and what drew me to it after having worked with NGOs for, for quite some time, both in the field and at headquarters, was I was looking for sort of more of a global viewpoint um, having a just a larger scale impact just because the UN works in you know almost every country um, so it does have that that ability to sort of go to scale um, to be able to have also a little bit more um, of an advocacy role with donors so obviously the UN has donors but it can also advocate back to donors in terms of um, global policy um, and um, and, and I think also the, the, the component of working with governments, um, looking for sort of national solutions, um, working locally is really, really important. And I, I, you know, throughout my career, I've been happy to, to support local organizations, but um, I think that there has to be something also embedded at the national level um, in terms of sustainability. So that, that also sort of drew me to the, to the UN after having worked with NGOs. Um, yeah. Douglas? Well, so for me, I mean, if you want to do international criminal law, um, there was obviously the International Criminal Court, but that was when I was sort of coming into this, that was uh, not realistic for a variety of reasons and Cambodia sort of presented itself. So for me, you know, com coming into the UN was um, inevitable in that sense. If I wanted to do international criminal law, there was no other real avenue. Now, there are some others you can work with NGOs. There's some really interesting work being done in Syria and Iraq with uh, ISIS. There's, there's a lot of different ways in which you can approach it. But if you want to do a courtroom work and, and having sort of, um, in spite of myself, fallen in love with uh, the workings of the law and thinking about how it functions, going or entering the UN was, was almost inevitable. Um, and so I always say this, I mean, you know, I, I, if you want to work for the UN, I think you have to understand what the, what the advantages are, what you can do and what you can't do. So it's, a, it's, it's uh, um, incredibly powerful in terms of access to leadership to heads of state. I mean, it's, it, you know, in the, I mean, it's an intergovernmental inter organization. Um, so it's not an NGO. So we are, you know, at least I work in the secretariat. Uh, the so-called secretariat. So there, I mean, our budgets are approved by uh, the member states in the General Assembly. Um, we 
uh, are accordingly sort of handcuffed because our job is, is, is in part to be critical and we do, we, we do criticize, but the, the, the way in which we approach things is very different. And so there's a trade-off in terms of the access that you get and what you can do. Um, and then conversely, what you can't say are the ways in which you can say something. So, you know, I mean, I, I, uh, people make fun of me. I mean, I, I openly identify as an anarchist um, and I'm a lawyer and I work for the UN and people think I'm crazy and I am, but I, you know, there's certain sort of uh, 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 positional stances that you have to be willing to take and what you can say and what you can do. Now, you know, for me uh, on Saturday, because that's the start of the Afghan work week, I'll have a meeting uh, on, on, on uh, um, or MS teams with the Chief Justice of Afghanistan. Now, that's not something that most people can do. I've met several heads of state where I've, ha where I've sat in meetings with them. Um, that's not something that a lot of NGOs can do just by, by, uh, by dint of what they are. But conversely, because they can do that, and this is sort of the activist side of me that comes out that thinks, oh shit, this is bullshit. Like, what are you doing right now? Why are you doing the work this way? Why are you um, soft peddling on, on important issues, right? But then you think about, well, you know, if, if I'm doing this work, then I can also uh, advocate and I can implement a training program that will have an impact on these things. So there's a real trade-off between, you know, your positional stance and, and how much you're wedded to your own approach. Um, so that's the nature of it, you know. I would say, uh, 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 and that sort of feeds off the last part, I mean, about, uh, um, getting into the UN, yeah, the, the, the JPO, the junior professional officer route is, is great if you wanna be, uh, spend a career in the UN, that basically gives you lifetime employment. So that's really the, the and it has the, the Cadillac contract, uh, a so-called permanent contract that you get with it, which there are only very few of those in, in the UN system. Um, the other route is a UNV route um, and, uh, uh, that's also, I, I think, a good route. But, you know, it, 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 it again depends on, on, on where you want to go and how you want to work. There's a lot of flexibility, especially in the, in the agencies, funds, and programs, uh, because they are uh, program-driven a lot of times. So they, they're dependent on donor support in a way that the secretariat isn't. So the secretariat is probably the most uh, conservative in that, in that sense, where I work in, in a special political mission in Afghanistan, um, is the most sort of formal and the most... Uh, procedural and hierarchical in that sense. The lowest, you know, I mean, and, and then you can go to, and, and, and maybe Joanna has a different experience of this, uh, um, having worked with uh, UNHCR and, and, and other entities, but if you can find a project budget, if you are on the ground in a place where uh, the UN system is doing work, um, that that might be a way of getting into the system. But in the Secretariat, which is my experience, it's, it's a little bit more conservative, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. And can you can you both talk about kind of the differences and the impact of if you come in as a consultant, if, you, if you're there as a staffer, like what percentage of people are consultants, say you're working on the ground in a mission versus in a home office type of thing? Hmm. Whoever. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, for the agencies and funds and programs, as Douglas was saying, I think it, it, it really depends on the agency and on, a, you know, any given year. Um, there are quite a few there's a pretty high percentage of consultants. I don't know what the actual percentage is, um, but both at headquarters and in field offices. But honestly, I would say, I think for, you know, for, for colleagues who are coming in at the, you know, have to, after having a, a bachelor's or even just right out of a master's, um, mm -hmm. you, you can look for those, um, you know, good contracts, but that, that will set you on, you know, a certain path of, of always looking just for those, you know, as Douglas said, cat, Cadillac contracts, and you might, then also lose out on, on really rich field experience, which not only will make you better for the UN, but you know, possibly bring you greater reward. So I think, you know, even for the UN, I would agree with Douglas that um, you know, starting in the field is is really important. Um, I have seen, you know, I've been in Geneva for almost five years and I've seen quite a few interns who have just finished their masters and they're really fresh and ready to go. And they start in Geneva and they keep, they're desperate to, to stay and to keep getting a job in the headquarters. And I just want to tell them, get out, get out. <laughs> this is not it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's great. I mean, so if that's, you know, just knowing Tufts and the kind of people that, that go there and the type of people that end up in Epic, I think um, my biggest advice would be get out to the field, get out there. Um, however that may be, whether it's, you know, with an NGO or on a UNB contract, 
um, or on a consulting contract. And again, once you're there, especially if you consider, I mean, places like Central African Republic, if you speak French, if you're willing to go to these places, Chad, I mean, you'll move up pretty quickly, <laughs> which would be much harder to do if you were in Geneva exactly. or New York. So that's another thing to consider. So it's a little bit of both. You can think a little bit strategically, but also get really good experience um, in the field. Mm -hmm. Douglas? All right, so I, I was so engrossed in the answer that I forgot the question, but I'll just riff <laughs> on that then, if that's okay. I'm Being a little bit, consultant, you know, consultant versus staffer. And oh, the consultant versus the contract. Oh. Um, Your contract you know, I would say, I'm sorry. At this point, I've been up. I've I've been sitting at my desk for 13 hours working today <laughs> because I'm on Afghanistan time. So yeah. that means getting uh, sitting down at six. So I'm sorry if I'm a little bit um, uh, spacier than usual. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I well, so in the Secretariat again, which is my experience, you know, there are, are fewer consultants. My first job was in the Secretariat in the tribunal as a consultant, working mm -hmm. in Cambodia for $500 a month. Um, and no health insurance, um, which is sort of on probably the lowest end of the, the spectrum. And it was also the most fun that I've ever had um, working, um, prosecuting. And, and, and again, for me, sort of because of my uh, um, sort of internal sort of try, er, trying to reconcile with myself what it means to be German, what it means to, 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 to think about uh, atrocities and so on. I mean, it was it was super exciting and also sort of because of my political stance, uh, um, thinking about how wrong the Khmer Rouge got things in the final analysis um, and sort of trying to come to terms, you know, politically as sort of a, 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 a civil libertarian, but then also as, as sort of a Marxist in that sense. So that was, that was hugely fun. And I, I would say don't preclude that. So, I mean, you know, as, as handcuffing as perhaps working for the UN can be, especially I think in the secretariat, since it's a, it's a political beast. Um, there are some really amazingly fun experiences that you can have. And I have never worked in, in a headquarters. I mean, this is the longest stretch that I've had um, working in, you know, in, in Europe. I, I guess when I was doing the Libyan Civil War, I was living in, in Sicily. Um, so that was quite nice. But this is the longest stretch that I've had in seven or eight years of living in in, in Europe, um, or not living in, in, in Africa or Asia. So, and I have no desire in that, in that sense to go to, to, to Geneva, um, as much as my, my mom would love me to, to, to get a job in Europe. Um, it's, it's really uh, uh, fun, I think, being in the field because you can get access, I mean, in, in many places, just because of the, the local context and the local circumstances. Um, there is, there, there, I think is, is, is more freedom in, in some circumstances uh, to, to get involved. I mean, that also means you have to be sort of more conscious because you are an outsider. I mean, I think that I am free to say things about the US or about Germany in ways that I don't feel comfortable saying about Afghanistan or Liberia uh, because it's not my country. And so, I mean, you know, in that sense, you might want to be, you have to be culturally delicate about it. But, you know, the, the amount of access that you can get, I think, and the amount of, of impact and also working with people um, is, is I think much higher in the field. So in that context, you know, I would, I would definitely try to, to go through the, the field route. Um, and then, you know, if you're, in, if you're like me and then, you know, you're uh, uh, don't have, you, you end up, I mean, it does have a consequence on, on your life and your, your, your sort of personal life and your friendships uh, um, because, you know, I spend all of my life in places where nobody can visit me. Um, and I live in armed compounds. And that has a certain sort of toll as well of working the field. Maybe it's different in the Central African Republic. I think there people live in Bungi in the city itself. So, you know, it, it, but I, again, I guess, yeah. Uh, consultancy is good. If you can get a job, good. But go wherever, go wherever your heart leads you and wherever you're curious. I think that if you're, if you're fascinated by something, that's always the best thing. And if you are fascinated by, by a job in New York on the sanctions committee or wherever it might be with UN women talking about their global coordination on rule of law um, and the so-called global focal point or something like that, then do that. I mean, that's, that's because that's, that's fun. That's, that, that's the exciting part of it. So you don't have to go to the field either. Um, I'd say just do whatever your, your heart tells you and your mind tells you to do. Great. I mean, I guess one of the things that comes up in thinking about that is sometimes people are in school or they're leaving school or maybe grad school and they think there's kind of a, a straight line options to things, right? And I wonder if you both could talk about the role kind of opportunity 
or serendipity played kind of in, in where you ended up or how you found your choices? Okay. Yeah, yeah <laughs> no, I, let me come back. I just wanted to come back on something that <laughs> Chuck said because I think also at some point, and, and you'll, you know, you'll think about this if you're working for NGOs as well, um, you know, sometimes you, you come back to Europe or to, to your home countries also for different reasons. And so um, there's always that later. So, I mean, I have two small kids now, so it's just a little bit easier here than in some other places. Um, like I wouldn't want to be in a non-family duty station and be away from them, but some people are willing to do that. So these are also questions that will come up, you know, down the line, especially for those who are still undergraduates. Um, and I certainly was not thinking about that when, when, at that point or in my 20s, but, um, but, it, but it comes. So it's a question, I think, for any of these um, jobs where you're really, yeah, working at the front lines, so to speak, um, and mm -hmm. trying to find that balance. Um, but in terms of serendipity, and I think this links, I saw that there are a couple of questions in the chat box just about, you know, if you can't get in through the JPO side, and I, I didn't, I had applied as an American, and I think I got to the final interview for one, but they're very competitive, and there weren't many American ones at the time. So um, there are other avenues, and I think um, the serendipity and also the connection comes from the, I mean, linking with alumni is really a huge, huge way to go. Um, so if you can link up with, you know, your undergraduate or your graduate alumni, that's how I got my first, um, the first internship that I did with UNDP um, was through an alumnus uh, from, from SEPA, but, but still, and then I, I also maintained contacts with Tufts alumni, and I asked them for advice, um, and so I think um, you know, and that, that sort of sets you on a certain, a certain path and then, it, and then it goes from there. But I think that can be a really great way to also get a foot in the door. If you say, look, I'm willing to go, you know, here or here, I'm, I'm passionate about this and I see that you're working on that, um, you know, use all your, your skills that you have, language skills. Um, if you've already, you know, I saw one of the questions, if you've already been to grad school, then, um, you know, pitch yourself, um, show, you know, what, what your niche is, what you can add. And, and I think also, you know, what we were saying about the passion and doing what you're interested in, that, that will come through. And so even, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're open and, um, and you can show that, uh, then, you know, and you're willing to maybe not take the perfect contract, but you're willing to be a consultant, then I think there, there are entry points for sure. Yeah. Douglas? So just to pick up on, on, on that, oh, well, being ready to move and, 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 and to not be locked down now, I lived in five countries but before the time I reached 10. So, I mean, this is sort of being a nomad is sort of easy for me in that sense. Uh, um, and, and what was that, you know, was it, was it Twain who said, no, it was, uh, um, uh, you know, be, be wary of any job that requires new clothes. And so now all of a sudden, you know, you get a little bit older and you sort of move along and all of a sudden you have multiple suits and then you have multiple blue colored suits. and world gets more complicated so that's something i don't like but in the sense that you know if you're willing to travel and and to and to be available you know i think that uh, uh, so for instance when i was at in in arusha the first time at the rwanda tribunal i i busted my ass for uh, uh for for a stretch and then i've been promised that oh well you know we'll get the funding and we'll keep you on and then that didn't happen so i uh went home uh to germany and uh I was really down about it because you know you you put in the effort and people recognize the effort and then that's not enough. And I was sitting, or I was at my at my cousin's wedding and I came home on a Sunday and I got an email uh, from a former colleague saying, um, "Hey, I've got a job. I know that you're looking for something. Um, can you give a call?" So I called and they said, "Okay, um, I'm in Bahrain working on this on this uh, human rights commission." Um, if you want a job, you've got it, but you got to be here tomorrow. And so I thought, okay, well, why not? So I just threw all of my stuff in my, in my backpack um, and I got on a plane. I showed up at the airport and, and the ticket was there waiting for me. And that was actually the bizarre part is that, you know, I didn't even have any information uh, about the, the flight. So I just got in the, in the you know, the, the second class line. I come up to the, to the counter and then, you know, I give a woman my passport. And then she says, oh, why didn't you go through the business class lane? And I thought, oh, well, you know, I didn't even know. So, you know, that kind of making yourself available, I think, is, is important, you know. And, and, and in that sense, hard work um, does get you recognized. People appreciate it. I mean, there are a lot of people, I don't know what, what uh, um, Joanne's experience is. You know, the UN is, is um, a mixture of people who are 
committed and sort of married to the to the to the notion in that sense. But there are also a lot of people, and this is a hard thing, you know, for me sometimes. In the sense, I do think of myself as being very ideological in that sense, in in, in a positive sense, um, is that you have a lot of people who are there because you earn better than you do in NGOs, and you do earn better than you do in a lot of other positions. Um, uh, although not always, if you work in American law, private practice, you learn more than you do in the UN. But there are a lot of people who are simply working for a paycheck, and that's and that's hard. So if you um, bust your ass, then people will also recognize that, and they'll be they'll work to keep you around. And so I think that you know making yourself available and 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 being hardworking are the two I think the two most important aspects of that. Um, obviously, being smart is important. Being interested is important but but really industry i think um gets you a long way mm -hmm. and can you talk a little bit about um kind of having both kind of soft skills and hard skills and kind of what's helpful to have or what's helpful to develop whether you're still an undergrad or you're going to grad school like what what would be complementary what would be seen as an asset Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think on the on the programming side, certainly the social science research skills um, are really important. Um, I mean, if I think about, you know, between Epic and Professor Penben, who's now retired, but who was basically my inspiration at Tufts. Um, I mean, I learned, I think, everything that I know now about uh, monitoring and program quality and things like that, that started at Tufts with just the social science research, either in the history department or in international relations, and I'm sure they have even a much broader spectrum of things now. So I see the question also about, you know, having a background in research. And so, I mean, I think it really depends on what you want to do. I did consider in graduate school, I, I wasn't sure if I should do more of those qu quantitative courses, um, you know, statistical methods and things like that. And I did the basics, but it just wasn't really my thing. And I think then the question is, you know, what do you want to use and what do you want to do? So now, you know, I, I certainly supervise research and I hire consultants and I've been a consultant even for a couple of years myself, but I didn't do the, the quantitative research because it just wasn't my passion. Um, so I think that's also important. So if you think that there's something that, you know, you should have the basic skills in, then, then certainly do it. But if, if it's really, you know, not something that you think you could see yourself doing in the long term, sort of on a day-to-day -day basis, um, then, then, you know, go in a different direction and, and try to get the other skills that you need. So I think, I mean, having a background in research certainly didn't, doesn't hurt. And, um, you know, for me, it helped me to also refine what I was interested in. Um, and again, for programming, I think there, you know, in humanitarian programming and in development programming, there's more and more of a push now to show results and to show outcomes. Um, and even if you can contract with different, you know, digital service providers and different researchers and things like that, you, you want to have the basic knowledge to be able to oversee that kind of work. I think it can be helpful. Um, but, um, but yes, I mean, I think the, the sort of mix of skills that you can get in the social sciences at Tufts is, is pretty good. And you can top that up with a grad school degree if you're, if you're looking at programming. Um, but I, I also have colleagues who, who don't have that background at all. And they've, they certainly managed to move ahead in program management. Douglas? So for me, I don't have any quantitative skills. And I don't have a background in any of that. So for me, doing the work that I do, you know, the, I guess the hard skill was getting, uh, becoming a lawyer, getting credentialed at least. And, you know, for better or worse, the world, you know, looks at the number of degrees that you have. Um, I think in the UN, you know, the, the, um, the P11 or the personal history profile that you used to apply for jobs before you even get to what you've done, it lists your, your academic background for better or worse. Um, but, you know, so if it, depending on what you want to do, you might have to go and, 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 and get a specialized degree um, in it. Um, I think that also, you know, I mean, part of my, part of my, I, I think my personal value, I mean, I don't, I don't have any great illusions about how, I, how good I am as a lawyer. I think I write well. Um, I think that, you know, I'm smart enough, but I'm certainly not the, the smartest person around. Um, but I think that sort of the soft skill of, of, of being able to forge effective relationships, um, I think is really, is really important because um, you do have to, you do work, or at least in, in the UN context, where your um, effectiveness is based on the relationship, or at least in, in the secretariat context and political mission, is the, the, the relationships that you build with government counterparts. 
and sort of navigating that, you know, and my boss who is, you know, a, a really great lawyer, um, is smarter than I am, she often dispatches me to sort of fix relationships and, and to sort of get things done in that sense. So I, I you know, I, I think that that's, that's the other skill to have is, is to be agreeable, I guess, to people as well. And, you know, that's, that's, a, that's my, my, my way is sort of being self effacive and, you know, joking about going bald and, you know, being old and all of those things. And, and, and you know, that, that works for me. And I think everybody sort of has to find that, that sort of skill because there are also jobs. I mean, you know, I, there is a, a guy named Tocilovsky at the, at the Yugoslavia Tribunal. And he spent his entire life um, as, as a so-called P4, which is, you know, senior, it's not the top. Um, but he had an encyclopedic mind of, of, of case law. Um, and so he could say, oh, you'd go to him and ask him for a specific problem. And he would say, oh, look at, you know, page 12 of this pretrial motion or the decision on pretrial motion in case X. And you'll find there the answer to what you need and the citation you need. And there are people who have that, that sort of skill and that's their value. And then there are other people whose value is really to, to, be, to be a mensch in that sense. And, and that's sort of, I think, where I, I fit in. I mean, I think I'm, I'm a good enough lawyer. I, I don't want to disparage myself that way. But again, I think just being, being able to, to, to get things done and to, and to facilitate those relationships is, um, is also an important sort of soft skill, if that's what you were asking for in soft skill. Yeah, no, it's, it's yeah, exactly. It's like, and part of that kind of networking and building relationship, yeah. right? So that you can, you can build on that. Um, and just going off of that, one of the questions um, is for you, Douglas, on how does your JD and LLM degrees, how do they support your work in the UN, you know, with the tribunals and other agencies and in the missions? Like, is that, you know, what is the critical piece for you in being where you are? Well, I think, you know, obviously I work as a lawyer for the UN. So, you know, having that, it's, it's maybe the law is, is one of the most, um, uh, has the, the, the greatest divergence in the way in which people approach problems. Um, one of my, one of my colleagues in the office, I mean, I'm a common law lawyer in the sort of the, the Anglo-Saxon tradition. Um, mm -hmm. One of my colleagues is a, is a Kenyan, or two of my colleagues are Kenyan, and, and one is, is Austrian. And, so, and then we have a Sharia law scholar, and we have mm -hmm. a, a civil Afghan lawyer who doesn't mm -hmm. use Sharia. And so then trying to reconcile very different modes of thinking about, about problems, how to approach a problem. Because mm -hmm. my first, my first uh, instinct is to go to American constitutional law or American criminal procedure law, which is a lot of ways similar, but also has, has, has big uh, uh, different approaches to it. So for instance, right now um, we are, because of, of COVID, we're talking about the introduction of remote hearings in, in, Afghan, in Afghan courts. And the way an Afghan trial works is, I mean, so is so radically different from what I understand as a trial. So in, in, in Afghanistan, the prosecutor interviews everyone, puts together a case file, gives it to the judge. The judge reads it, maybe gives it back to the prosecutor for more evidence, then calls everyone in. Everybody makes a, an oral submission or the defense might make a, a written submission beforehand on the case file. And then, you know, basically, the prosecution gets up, says its piece, the defense gets up and says its piece, the judge asks some questions, the accused person gets up and says her piece, and then the judge issues a verdict, which is so radically different from how I conceive of, of a trial working. And so then thinking about, okay, so now I've got to put myself in the context of working in, in an Afghan court, and then also thinking, well, what are the, the mechanisms for doing a video trial, and how would that work, and having parties in different places and so there's a lot of those those questions but of course you always go back to your to your uh, well of, of 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 your training but i think in the end for me you know being a lawyer and, and studying philosophy i guess in that context too is just thinking about how to approach problems and and thinking about thinking about things i guess and that mm -hmm. second order uh, uh approach to problems um has been really i think the most important part and and being beaten into submission as a, as a first year law student, especially in that first semester is a, is a, is a, is a painful experience, but it also, you know, it, it breaks you in a lot of ways and you get rebuilt and think about uh, problems in, in a different way, maybe worse, maybe better in some ways. So 
you know, for me, I think it's indispensable for what I want to do. Although not always because, you know, uh, American constitutional law, for instance, has no bearing on the way in which um, a, a case might proceed in Afghanistan. In Liberia, it's slightly different because of the American colonial experience there, the experience with sort of a, a, an almost de facto colonial experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then at the tribunals, you know, there was just sort of picking the systems and, and depending on the, the vagaries of, of, of the judges and your colleagues. So, you know, I, I think law is, is fun. I mean, I like being a lawyer. And I like the way that I think about things, but it also makes you, you know, it, it changes you as well, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I don't know if that responds exactly to the, to the, to the question. So if I ever do, just say Hanson, you know, get on track and then I'll shut up. <laughs> No, it's fine. And then, uh, Joanna, for you, uh, so a question about, you know, how valuable the research you did during your Fulbright was in terms of next steps, whether grad school or, you know, the NGOs or the UN. Yeah, I mean, I kind of talked about it in the, in the last question as well, but I think, um, I mean, it, if, especially if you have a, a topic that you're passionate about, I think it can um, it can help to sort of refine your thinking. Um, you know, if you're working, especially if you're doing field research and you're working with local organizations or international NGOs, that can also be an interesting way um, to enter into into some of those um, kinds of organizations as well. Um, and um, I mean, certainly, again, having having access to and working with um, you know, national academic institutions, as I as I did on the Fulbright, and um, and and local women's organizations or other um, sort of local networks is also, um, you know, it's an, it's another way to do that. So it, it can be really interesting in that sense as well. So mm -hmm. I think I think it did help me. And then, um, you know, maybe if you have that experience, then you may not need to do as many of those kinds of classes in graduate school, or vice versa. If you don't do research in the field, you might do it. In graduate school, I know, for example, now at at SIPA, where I went at Columbia, they um, they they have a, a, a required course that all um, development and humanitarian students have to take, where they're doing um, sort of a, a pro bono consulting project, which typically involves some kind of research as well. So um, mm -hmm. I think you know it comes in one way or the or another, but um, definitely do you know try to focus on something that that's of interest to you. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, uh, another question is. Uh, that I think Joanna, you mentioned having read, but what advice do you have for a grad student who is later in their careers and too old for the junior officer program? What avenues would you recommend for getting into the UN system? Yeah, I mean, from my side, as I mentioned, I think that, um, you know, linking up with alumni is really a smart yeah. way to go. Um, you know, if you just apply sort of cold, you know, through UN um, websites and you don't have any connections, um, sometimes that can be difficult. Um, you know, I'm speaking on my personal in my personal capacity right now. So it's it's not that if you know someone that means you get a job, not, not at all. But um, but if you um, you know if you can if you can understand a little bit better the context of where that you know what that role is, um, mm -hmm. if you know sort of the kind of experience that's being looked for, and if you've already had some you know internship or consulting experience with you know the team that you're looking at. Um, because there's so many different sort of niches that you can have within the UN system, as you've seen already, you know, so far, um, I think that that can really help. So if, if you can um, work through alumni or um, be able to get, you know, small projects at least, or your first foot in the door or your first internship in that way, um, even for grad students, I mean, I started as an intern after grad school with, you know, some tiny stipend, and then from there was able then to get sort of first jobs, real jobs, um, then that was, yeah, I think that's a good way to go. Great, great. Um, Douglas, anything to, did you want to add to that or? Okay. So um, another question is, to what extent have you considered working for your own national government versus staying at an international organization? <laughs> We're both smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas, do you want to take that first? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, you know, for me working, well, uh, my boss in Liberia for, for a while was uh, an American uh, uh, State Department lawyer, and she then tried to afterwards recruit me to go to, it was Rhode Island, the Naval Defense Academy or something like that, to Naval go and Park do College. work. So, yeah, the Naval War College, there you go. 
uh, uh, you know, and, and she was a, a, a D1, and I mean, fairly senior then also in the State Department when she went back and then was, was seconded from there to, the, uh, um, to, to Rhode Island. Um, and then she wanted me to come and, and, and it was very hard to tell her without seeming sort of insulting about her is that there's just no way that, that, I, could, that I could work for uh, the federal government, um, you know, even, even under, under the previous president. That was just for me because of, of, of my approach to the world. It would have been impossible. You know, my, my father um, was, was, you know, declared before they uh, introduced conscientious objectors in you know, in, in the U.S. during Vietnam. My father before that was declared, uh, um, I think, you know, mentally unfit for combat because he refused to, 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 to be drafted in the, in the early 60s while he was in the civil rights movement. Um, so it just it was inconceivable. And even now, you know, having to, it's, it's and, I, and I say all this off the record, so please don't uh, um, sort of comment too loudly on this uh, to, to other people is it you know look it, again it depends on what you're willing to do I mean I'm, I'm, I'm sort of an internationalist I don't um, I, I've, I've spent parts of my life in the US I've spent parts of my life in Germany you know part of me the, the sort of the German experience is that you know governments can do wonderful things but governments can also do horrible things and I'm uh, aligned to I think principle um, rather than patriotism in that sense so uh, you know for me working for a government uh, at least working for the UN I've never had a problem so far where I've had to uh, support a position that I don't that I don't support um, and I'm not to to disparage uh, my colleagues who you know work for the for various uh, foreign ministries in the countries where I work but you know they also have to take certain um, professional stances uh, that I'm not sure that I'd always feel comfortable with or prospectively that just the worry about it would be too great that it wouldn't that it wouldn't feel comfortable for me and that's again just a function of, of, of who I am and 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 sort of the way in which I look at and approach the world and I already feel somewhat uh, um, out of place sometimes um, when when I you know working for the UN not quite being sure if that's quite the right place for me politically mm -hmm. But I think that at the same time, you know, we are dependent, and in, in that sense, on our uh, colleagues uh, um, from 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 national governments. And a day doesn't go by in which I don't call up the head of of INL at the U.S. Embassy uh, in in Kabul, and we have a very good working relationship, and we're friends. I mean, he invited he he invites me to some some social gatherings that they have, um, and getting into U.S. embassies anywhere in the world is a royal pain in the ass. So sometimes I just decline just on logistical basis but at the same time it's just what you can what you can reconcile yourself to i think is the ultimate the ultimate question and there's dignity in doing that work as well and i think standing up for institutions and right now uh, you know speaking sort of very politically i think right now more than ever there's there's a need to strengthen institutions and to really ensure that they have um the strength to resist i think a, a real onslaught on 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 them um, and, and so in that context, I think it's also, you know, working for the government is dignified, doing right is dignified, uh, being principled is, 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 is dignified, um, or dignifying, um, but it all just depends on what you feel comfortable with. And, and for me, I, I don't think that I would feel comfortable um, working for any, any government, mm -hmm. national government. Gotcha, gotcha. Joanna? Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's a good question, and I, I'm not sure if the person who asked the question was American, but um, certainly for you know the the U.S. State Department, I had a number of colleagues, and um, especially from graduate school, who went on to work from the, for the State Department and came from very um, diverse backgrounds, even though you know from from within the U.S., but um, you know with different many of them with with dual nationalities and. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to, to be done from the inside for sure, um, and and the same could be said for the UN that. Um, you know, if you if you're looking to to make changes as well in in big bureaucracies, that could be within your um, your national government, um, foreign you know foreign affairs department or um, development departments, um, or it could be within the UN, um, or even some of the larger NGOs. So um, so there certainly is work to be done in in that way. Um, and I also have a number of colleagues who've um, gone back and forth between their um, various national governments as well. So. France, Italy, um, the, the Scandinavian countries, the UK, they have um, quite strong um, um, 
sort of um, rosters and cohorts of, of technical experts in humanitarian and development affairs. And some of them, for example, the Norwegians and the Danish even have um, standby rosters, they call them, where they deploy um, people to the UN. And so, you know, if that's a possibility as well, sometimes you don't even have to be a national of that country. So it can also be another way, actually, I should have mentioned it earlier, to, to, to even an entry point to the UN um, in different areas. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, for me, I just, I was interested in international NGOs and the UN for its sort of intergovernmental nature, um, as Douglas was saying, sort of being the, the sum of its parts in that way. Um, but I think there's also, of course, um, interesting, certainly interesting technical work to be done um, on behalf of, of um, national governments. And then, you know, eventually, I think once you, you move up to a senior enough position, then you can also have sort of an advocacy role to play, but maybe it depends on the personality as well and sort of your level of patience um, in order to get to that level. So I think maybe I was a little impatient after getting out of grad school. <laughs> yeah. Nice, okay. Here's a question. Um, thank you both for sharing your experiences. I had some questions about the humanitarian field. I spent the past year working at Oxfam America with their humanitarian team on disaster risk reduction. While there I heard a lot about the evolution of the humanitarian sector and the humanitarian nexus, and particularly on the role of development slash humanitarian agencies and NGOs, which are shifting focus from directing their own interventions and sending people in the field to becoming a more supportive and donor role for local actors and initiatives. I was wondering what you thought about this shift occurring in the humanitarian sector, and maybe what you would advise to someone interested in starting out in the humanitarian world. Yeah, no, this is this is a whole other conversation, maybe. But um, no, I think you, you've hit the nail on the head. It's certainly that's certainly one of the big um, discussions and debates in, in the humanitarian sector, um, particularly since the grand bargain commitments in 2016. And the grand bargain is basically a, a compact between donors, um, major UN agencies and um, the Red Cross as well on um, on how to basically do better humanitarian work and um, support the humanitarian development nexus. Um, and so one of the big themes therein is called localization um, and that, you know, another sort of big word, but meaning work, you know, working more with local actors, building the capacity of local NGOs. Um, Oxfam has also has always been at the forefront of that. And I think, um, you know, sadly, they recently announced even that they will be scaling down a number of their country offices. And but part of the reasoning behind that is also to support, um, you know, if I've understood well, to support um, local actors as well. So. So I think that's definitely one of the directions that the humanitarian sector is is moving in. Um, you know, again, fundamentally, the UN does support support governments. Um, so the you know the UN agencies that that I work with um, work through implementing partners, and they might be international NGOs or national or local NGOs or civil society organizations, um, or in the case of UNFPA where I work now, um, local health facilities and midwives. So we're talking really um, sort of grassroots level. Um, but yes, I mean, in terms of capacity building, there's still quite a long way to go. And I think COVID, the COVID context has also shown us, for example, when we can't send in surge capacity, um, that we're looking at sort of local and regional capacity and things like that. So, um, so, so it's an important, an important theme. Um, and in terms of, you know, linking to, to someone who's just starting out in the humanitarian field, um, again, it's just sort of, it's one of the major themes and um, and that's why I think, you know, being in a, in a position where you are seeing the types of partnerships that can happen at the country level um, is important because you can see what that really um, looks like on the ground. And it, yeah, so it's, it's one thing when we say we want to be more local, we want to support organizations, but what does that concretely mean in terms of funding and training and, um, and those sorts of things? Douglas? I'll just say very briefly, you know, you can't do anything without having uh, locals who work with you and so insofar as that's you know people who really want to have a top-down approach to things are, are bound to fail because there's no way that I could ever have a, a context a contextual understanding of the countries in which I work without having somebody to, to either implement it because I don't speak the language or because I need somebody to actually explain things to me and, and make sure that you know, I'm being appropriate in the way in which I approach them. So I think that's that's a good thing. I, I would just say, I mean, the, the only other part of it is um, sometimes it's, it's very difficult uh, for my national colleagues, and this is not quite the same, but I think also that pertains to national NGOs, is that we as, as internationals are transient. So we come into a place and we're there for 
a certain number of years, two years, three years, four years, and that has its drawbacks, but it also means that we are free sometimes to go into meetings and say something that a national couldn't because she has to live there and she would then have to face the minister or whoever, and that minister would look back at her and say, no, so there, there's certain sort of context in which I am free to say and do things that, um, that, that a national couldn't. So, uh, you know, it's a double-edged, or, you know, it's a both and, not either or, I think, but in general, um, in, in implementing things, uh, and this doesn't apply to the secretariat, but I think in, 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 in agencies, funds, and programs, having someone on the ground who, who is there, who has a long-term investment in the country and being in the country is, is indispensable um, and needs to be supported more and, and thinking about this synergistically. Great. And our, uh, our last question is, um, has the hierarchy, bureaucracy, international politics involved with working at the UN ever been frustrating for you? I think we'll have to turn off the recording. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's more, how do you, how do you, how do you find ways to work in a bureaucracy where yes. things can, you know, is it things move slowly? How do, how are, how are decisions made? How's the connection to what's happening on the ground reflect back to kind of the main, the main offices, you know, whether in Geneva or New York or wherever. Hmm. hmm. I need a minute to think about it, Doug Douglas. So, <laughs> so, well, I'll say that it was so a good question, Heather. Yeah. Part of the frustration is also internal because I, I think that, as, as Joanna said earlier, you know, people are hierarchical within the UN too, and and people sort of, you know, having who did who did you share a document with before it was sent to so and so, and that sometimes evolves and people have little turf things. And I think that that's actually probably the most frustrating sort of politically in, in my context, sometimes as I think my colleagues. I think that in general, you know, having some humility about the work that we do and to think about, I mean, you know, all, all of these systems, the, the places that we work, we work in because um, something is not functioning quite right. Um, and I think that, you know, looking at the U.S. right now, uh, looking at, at many places in Europe right now, and uh, the, the, despite the incredible development and the institutions that have grown up um, coming now from the, from the legal perspective, quite clearly things are not right here either. Um, so I think having some humility in, in terms of the timeframes in which we approach problems um, in, in the countries in which we work, I think is important. And there's a sort of a delicate line between being sensitive to uh, the difficulty with which, it, with which things work and, um, and then also trying to, to, to draw a hard line about uh, needing to implement things. So right now, you know, in, in, in Afghanistan, this is very public, uh, uh, you know, corruption is one of the major issues. I mean, it's, it's down near the very bottom of Transparency International's uh, Corruption's Perceptions Index. Everybody knows that um, corruption is a big deal. Um, the government, accepts that certain people need to be arrested and to face trial for that, and nobody then executes these arrest warrants. And so people are still wandering around um, or they're covered by it. And so that's frustrating, right? I mean, everybody feels frustrated about those things, but it's also, you know, then trying to, to, to steer uh, the, or navigate the fine line between uh, applying pressure on, on, on local counterparts and then also being sensitive to, to the reality within, realities within which they work in Liberia, that was also the same. You know, I worked with the, the special representative, that the secretary general, um, as a special assistant, and you know, you get dispatched, you know, to 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 go and uh, um, discuss something with a minister, and you sit down, and you end up talking about people's families and, and all that sort of stuff, and you're really waiting to get to the to the point at hand, um, and that's frustrating. But at the same time, you have to, I think, also just appreciate, uh, um, just as a matter, I think, of basic respect for the for the countries in which we work and the people that work there and, and the governments with which we work, that uh, you can't just be bullheaded about it. Um, and so in that context, I think I also understand, or I've tried to be appreciative at least of, of the challenges that my colleagues face and sort of trying to understand, or my national you know, government uh, colleagues, um, and to try to see the realities from which they work and to, to see about how, how hard you can push and where you can push and then also where you need to know, where you need to sort of soft pedal and, 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 and be gentler about things. 
uh, because ultimately they are the ones that have the, the levers of, of power in their country. Um, and so that is, that's part of it. And, and, and again, that's the, the sort of the handcuff thing that I, that I spoke about at the start is that working for the UN, you simply can't do certain things, right? I mean, it just doesn't work because of the nature of our relationship with our host states. And there are exceptions, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, there are all sorts of different people uh, who, who do take a more, uh, not adversarial, but a more um, public stance about things that they disagree with. And then there are others that are very much sort of a technical, you know, technical approach uh, or technical role. And that's like the work that I have right now is very much technical, calling up the guy who works for the, you know, the, the international crimes prosecutor in Afghanistan and, you know, trying, understanding for him what the difficulties are for prosecuting um, Afghans, well, you know, technically international forces, technically ISIS, technically the government, um, and, and the realities within which he operates that are very different in which government officials are killed often. Understanding, you know, that he himself doesn't have police that report to him. There are a lot of different parts of this. And so that's, that's part of the excitement too, is, is, is trying to, and, and, and the intellectual curiosity that you have, about, about approaching problems and seeing how to, to, to actualize or to, to, to make a change in, in contexts in which change is very difficult because of the circumstances in which, in which countries find themselves. And, and in many cases like Afghanistan, the wariness with which people might approach uh, outsiders as well. Um, you know, and that's, and, and that's, uh, that's part of the difficulty. And that's the wonder is that you do have this access, but the, the challenge is that you, is that, you, know, you don't have uh, unfettered freedom to, to say what you want to say sometimes, or maybe what even needs to be said sometimes. Mm -hmm. Joanna? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think in terms of um, sort of hu human politics, you can find it, you know, anywhere, whether it's, um, you know, nonprofits or NGOs or academia. So um, it's everywhere. Um, and I think that, and, and I put it in the chat box, but I think, um, you know, the question of sort of just communications and learning how to um, work with, you know, people from, from very different backgrounds, whether it's their professional background, the types of, you know, degrees that they have, um, the working environments that they come from, um, that's part of the, maybe the, you know, the, the challenge, but also the, the real, ex really exciting part of working with the UN and such international um, institutions. So, um, so I think if you sort of keep your eyes on, on, on the goals, um, and at least in, in my work on programming, um, you know, the goal is really to support country offices as much as possible. And by that, I mean supporting you know, our clients and, and beneficiaries at the, at the end of that line. So if you sort of keep that in mind, um, and you're trying to, you, know, you might need to do a little bit of sort of side to side, but, um, but you're trying to, to sort of keep that goal in mind, um, then I think, then you learn ways to, to maybe cut through the bureaucracy. And if I think about you know, some of the best um, supervisors I've had and who've had you know, good careers at the UN, but also came from different backgrounds as well, research, um, NGOs. And I think that's kind of what they taught me that if um, you, know, you support your team, you support your teammates, um, you know, try to take what's, what's best about the UN, that it has that you know, sort of power in numbers um, the sum of its parts and that it, it, it reports to member states, but it can also um, sort of give feedback back to member states. So mm -hmm. if I think about something, for example, you know, when we talk about bureaucracy, we might think there are a lot of procedures and policies and, and that can weigh things down and it can take a little bit longer than if you're in a kind of, um, you know, a startup NGO or, or something like that. Um, but on the other hand, for example, the UN has made a big effort in, in recent years to um, make policies on um, what we call the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse within the agency and with partners. And, and so there's been this sort of huge concerted effort. And um, I mean, when I started out in 2007, 2008, I don't remember seeing you know, those kind of codes of conduct and these kinds of procedures. So it might take a little bit of time, but to have something like that at the global level, and now you have to sign it no matter which agency you're working for and take an online trading no matter which agency you're working for. And whether you're you know, the truck driver or you're doing programming like I'm doing, it's the same. So in that sense, there can be also you know, something positive about that bureaucracy that you can standardize certain things um, and, and, and have that kind of accountability. So I guess it depends on how you look on it in any, any given day. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Well, you guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, 
and sharing all these insights. And, uh, and we'll look to see you soon, hopefully, maybe in person at some point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, We'd love to you. have you back back up to Tufts to, you know, to maybe talk and meet with the students directly once we can do that again. So that would be great. Yeah, good luck to everyone. And they can reach out also if they have other yeah. questions. Great, great. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay, thanks. Bye. Be well. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you.